I'd like to welcome you to our first contributor meeting, which is going to be given by Miklos Antal Werner from the Budapest University of Technology and Economics about the matrix, matrix product state simulations with general non abelian symmetries. Miklos, it's your turn. Okay, thank you very much for this kind opportunity, this nice opportunity, and uh, I just make it full screen. Yeah, uh, so I will talk about this project. This is a long time project of our group, but now uh, this general algorithm is getting published. So it's an archive since July, since July, but now it's accepted to PRB. So I hope in next week it will, it will be published. So first I will just give a short introduction. So, you are so not sharing, you are not sharing your screen. I'm not sharing my screen, sorry. Uh, yeah, I was, but no, I'm not. Do you, do you, do you see? Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, sorry. Yes. Uh, full screen. So now you see my slide. Yes. I hope. Okay. So first I will give a short introduction, uh, to matrix product states, and then I will show how I can generalize it for, uh, any kind of non abelian symmetries. Uh, I will talk about non abelian tensors and uh, their algebraic properties. And at the end, I will just show uh, as a demonstration how everything works on the SU3 Hubbard model. Okay. So uh, uh, our goal is to describe uh, some generic states with, um, in the MPS uh, description. So a generic state can be decomposed uh, having uh, the product basis uh, with these uh, uh, um, coefficients C. And we know that the dimension of this Hilbert space is a small d to the L. That means if uh, I have a large system, then the Hilbert space dimension is exponentially large. And then I can just draw such a tensor. This is the C tensor here. No, uh, I want to somehow uh, avoid this exponential scaling. Therefore, uh, I start to decompose my expansion coefficient. So uh, the decomposition is uh, called Schmidt decomposition. What I'm doing, uh, I cut the system in two parts. Let's say uh, left part is up to the uh, side small L, and the right part is from side L plus one to the end. And then I can decompose such a state. Uh, uh, using the Schmidt decomposition, where uh, I uh, get some uh, sum of products where uh, the uh, coefficients are the Schmidt values. These are always uh, positive real, uh, non-negative non real numbers. And then I have the left Schmidt states and the right Schmidt states. Uh, graphically, this decomposition can be done. Uh, I uh, cut this object into two, and this is just uh, a contraction of such a tensor, uh, such uh, two or actually three tensor. The lambda is a diagonal tensor, so this index is the same on the both sides. Okay, and now this Schmidt states uh, uh, can be, uh, in principle, can be uh, uh, found for any cut. So if I move the cut uh, one side to the right, so I try to get the new Schmidt states on this, uh, at the cut position L plus one, I can uh, give these states using the Schmidt states at cut position L and the local basis at uh, the site L plus one. And uh, this is a, uh, a left unitary uh, matrix. That means that from these products, it creates uh, normalized vectors, orthogonal normalized vectors, maybe not a full system on the L plus one uh, uh, one, one to the L plus one size, but this is the so-called left unitarity of uh, my matrices. And if I iterate this kind of uh, um, transformation, at the end I arrive to the so-called matrix product state uh, uh, NZ of my uh, wave function, where uh, this originally uh, a uh, big tensor having uh, capital L legs uh, will be decomposed as a contraction of uh, uh, order three tensors. Okay. 
and uh, what is the approximation? So this uh, up to this point we will we were uh, uh, exact, but now the uh, approximation is the truncation that. Uh, in the Schmidt decomposition, we keep only the capital M largest uh, Schmidt values, so we uh, truncate this state, and the truncation error is uh, the sum of the Schmidt value squares uh, for the discarded uh, Schmidt pairs. Okay, and if this if it's small, then uh, our state is uh, well described. If this truncation error is big. Then our state is not well described. Okay, and uh, I will show, uh, I will demonstrate my non abelian MPS on the so called time evolving block decimation algorithm. This is uh, 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 this algorithm solves the real time dynamics uh, defined by Hamiltonian, where all terms are just nearest neighbor terms. In that, uh, if uh, I have such a Hamiltonian, then I can uh, decompose the Hamiltonian on an even and odd uh, part. These are for the even bonds, and these Hamiltonians for the odd bonds. So these are uh, sums uh, on the even and sums on the odd bond. Uh, odd bonds. These uh, these uh, two side Hamiltonians. And now, if I have uh, this decomposition, then I can use the Suzuki Trotter uh, approximation for the time evolving operator. And at the end, I because uh, these uh, even and odd Hamiltonians are sums of uh, uh, commuting uh, two part two, uh, two side operators. At the end, I arrive to a scheme where uh, the time evolution is uh, just uh, uh, an application of uh, two side unitary gates and. Uh, the, the TBD algorithm solves the way if I have two MPS matrices and then apply such a two side gate, then I get something that is uh, not in the MPS form anymore. But with a singular value decomposition, I can go back to this uh, MPS form. And uh, uh, performing these steps uh, consecutively, I get uh, the time evolution of my state. Okay. So I will generalize this kind of algorithm, and I will generalize this kind of answers for non-abelian symmetries. So if I have a symmetry, then I have a symmetry group, and I have symmetry transformations for each group element. I have a unitary transformation, and my model is symmetric if the Hamiltonian commutes all uh, with all the sym uh, these symmetry transformations. Okay. No, I will uh, restrict myself to locally generated uh, generated symmetries. Uh, so U G U J uh, U G is a product of single side transformations. Uh, I have here uh, some examples. So, for example, such a symmetry is the U one charge conservation. In that, uh, the unitary symmetry is just a phase depending on the charge of the side. And if I have the total uh, uh, transformation and in the total uh, unitary transformation, it transforms according to the total charge and charge conservation is uh, uh, a consequence of uh, my symmetry. Again, if I have a, a conservation of the spin Z component in the SU2, uh, so the uh, usual spin S uh, Z component, then uh, I can, Define my uh, hem, uh, my unitary transformation according to this. If I have total SU two symmetry, then uh, of course I can rotate my system uh, uh, around any uh, uh, axis. So then I have this kind of uh, transformation. And now in our example, I will talk about the SU three cross U one symmetry. So I have a, a fermionic model. I have three colors of fermions, and uh, I have a full charge conservation. But besides that, I also uh, I am also symmetric uh, for uh, the SU three rotations in the color space. So any unitary transformation is allowed uh, in the color space. And besides that, I have this U one charge conservation. So and then in our model, I will investigate. We have SU three cross U one symmetry. Okay, if I have a symmetry, then uh, my Hilbert space can be spanned 
according to multiplets. So now we are uh, uh, spanning the Hilbert space uh, by putting the states into different representations. So these gammas are representations of the uh, symmetry group. Uh, for the simple U1 symmetry, gamma is just uh, the charge. For the SU2, gamma uh, represents the total spin. And for the SU3 cross U1 symmetry, gamma is a, an SU3 representation index combined with the U1, U1 charge. This is the representation index. For in each sector, I have many multiplets. T uh, indices the multiplets. And within a multiplet, I have uh, internal states. And this is the internal index, uh, small m. It goes from one to the dimension of the representation. Of course, because we have locally gener generated symmetries, the local side can be also be composed uh, using uh, the same way. Uh, so following the same way, I have the local representation index, a local multiplet index, and the local internal index for my size. And uh, now here comes an important point that if I have a singlet state, singlet means that the, total, the state uh, is in the trivial representation of my symmetry group. If I have a singlet state, then it can be shown that uh, the Schmidt decomposition results in uh, Schmidt states that have a well-defined rep uh, that belong to a well-defined representation. So the Schmidt states form also multiplets, and the Schmidt weights, Schmidt values uh, are uh, degenerate uh, within such multiplets. So this, but this is important that this is only true for singlet states. So if I have a non-singlet state that uh, has a non-trivial non representation gamma and it has a non-trivial uh, internal index. For such a state, it's not true anymore, but it's not a problem uh, at the end because it turns out that if I add an auxiliary site to my chain uh, that transforms according to the conjugate representation of gamma and I form a big singlet state uh, having uh, this uh, auxiliary, uh, auxiliary site added, and at the end, I can uh, decompose this <coughs> psi tilde that is um, uh, defined on a uh, Hilbert space where this auxiliary site is added. So, okay, so, so having just single states is not a restriction at the end. Okay, and what happens if I have, so now I have Schmidt states that um, for multiplets, and now what happens if I move the cut in such the such a decomposition uh, in, uh, in such case? Then uh, from the gamma TM states and the local states on the new side, gamma log tau mu, uh, I can form uh, multiplets, gamma primes. And uh, uh, the way I can form these multiplets is uh, uh, govern, uh, is uh, uh, described by the clebsch gordon coefficients of the group. So these are the generalized clebsch gordon coefficients of my group. That tells me if I have a, a representation gamma and a representation gamma local, how can I define a representation gamma prime? However, uh, <clears throat> contrary to the uh, usual SU2 group, I have an additional label alpha. This additional label alpha is called the outer multiplicity. This appears in the general case, but not, uh, doesn't appear in the SU2 case. This is called the outer multiplicity that measure, uh, that uh, labels the multiplets having the same gamma prime. So uh, I can uh, arrive in the situation where I get the same gamma prime, new representation, many times in the product of gamma cross gamma local. <coughs> uh, but, uh, and this can be different from one. So, so for the U1 and SU2 group, it's always one dimensional. In the U1 case, so if I have just charge, then I know if I combine charge N1 and charge N2, then I get charge N1 plus N2. But even in the SU2 case, if I have two spins and I combine them to a, a total spin S, then I know that this total spin can be between S1 minus S2 absolute value and S1 plus S2. But every spin appears only one in this decomposition. So there is no outer multiplicity in the SU2 group. But for example, in the SU3 and uh, SU4, SU5, so 
in SUN, usually I have non-trivial multiplicities, and it's good to have this alpha index here. And, uh, uh, and the other uh, thing that uh, I started to use a tensor notation, uh, I will uh, come back to it later, that these guys will be our NA tensors at the end. So I have some representation indices uh, in the bracket, and then I have some tensor indices, uh, and I also introduced incoming states and outgoing states, and the incoming legs are on the bottom, and outgoing legs are on the top. Uh, so subscripts and superscripts of the tensors. But now, if I have this uh, uh, relation, so I, I know how to use the Klebsch Gordon coefficients to create uh, the new multiplets, and I have this A matrix. Okay, I, I was not talking about the A matrix. So uh, when I have created a multiplets gamma prime, I even I have the freedom for, to uh, rotate in the multiplet space, and uh, this A tensor will do the rotation uh, in the multiplet space. So it doesn't have uh, internal legs uh, M, but it has multiplet uh, indices that tells me if I have the multiplets uh, created from T and tau, then I can rotate uh, in this space and I can create a T prime multiplets. And also alpha appears here because I have many uh, multiplets having uh, uh, so uh, coming from the uh, product of T and tau. So at the end of the day, I arrive uh, to a situation where I have <coughs> uh, a two-layer structure. I have uh, the bottom layer formed uh, by klebsch gordon uh, coefficients and the top layer formed by these A tensors. And uh, if I write everything down, then I realize that uh, uh, all these tensors have uh, three uh, representation indices. For, for example, for the Klebsch, I have the two incoming representation and the one outgoing representation, and the same are true for the A tensors. And uh, I also see that uh, within this description, I can reduce my bond dimension because the top, the bottom layer contains only the Klebsch Gordon coefficient, so it's not interesting for me. And all the inf relevant information for me is coded in the top layer, and the top layer. Uh, one bond index uh, indices one multiplet and not one state anymore. So that's why at the end I can uh, compress uh, my uh, state uh, on the at the level of multiplets. <coughs> and uh, so at this point, it's important to introduce uh, non-abelian tensors. So non-abelian tensors are these guys A and C. And uh, we can see that these are uh, block sparse tensors because they have uh, non-zero entries only if uh, the representation indices follow the selection rules that we have. Okay, uh, and for a for a given block key, so the block key is the uh, this. Uh, um, uh, three uh, representation indices, and for a given block key, I have a tensor uh, that is in this by, in these cases, four uh, standard tensor indices. <clears throat> but the other thing I have to realize that when I had my uh, MPS, uh, <clears throat> uh, non abelian MPS uh, structure, uh, some uh, representation indices were the same. Uh, in the Klebsch tensors and the A tensors, and also in the consecutive A tensors, I had some matches. I have to match the indices. For example, on, if, I am, if I am on the same site and the Klebsch tensor and the A tensor uh, have the same uh, representation indices, so gamma I minus one coming from the lab, a local and a, a right uh, representation uh, indices are the same uh, in the A and C tensor. Uh, and also, if I see on the consecutive sides, I see that uh, the outgoing representation index i is the same as the incoming representation of the next tensor. So when I uh, perform this contraction, I have to uh, I have to match these Europe indices before before I can do uh, the contraction. And now uh, we, re we realize that we can create structure 
where this matching is a is a, a result of uh, uh, of, of a rule that is uh, uh, defined for these objects. So we start uh, we, we define uh, dependencies of the legs. So for example, if I have uh, this ti leg, then uh, it, 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 uh, if, if we see what it, what it means, it means that I, I index uh, the uh, multiplets within the representation gamma i. And then I call uh, the dependency of ti is this gamma i index. Again, uh, if I have the internal uh, index mi, the dependency of mi is again gamma i, OK? Uh, the dependency of the local <clears throat> uh, multiplet index and the local internal index is the local uh, gamma i local. And uh, now if we look at the uh, uh, outer multiplicity lag, outer multiplicity measures how many times gamma i appears in the product of gamma i minus 1 and gamma i local. So I can say that the dependency of outer multiplicity lag is uh, all the three uh, representations. And now uh, we will say that uh, if I have, if I contract a leg that has some dependencies, then in the multiplication rules, it will be forced that then we, are, we have to match all the dependencies of the leg. This will be the rule. So now I can define my NA tensors. So NA tensor is a guy. Uh, it has some outgoing legs and incoming legs. Uh, and uh, the blocks are uh, uh, addressed by uh, some set of uh, representation labels, gamma 1 to gamma k. And now the statement is that I can contract two tensors if I contract an incoming black with an outgoing black. And uh, in that case, I have to uh, match the dependencies of the two tensors. So if, for example, if J2 depends on gamma 2 and gamma 3, then if I contract J2 with another tensor, then gamma 2 and gamma 3 has to be matched between the two tensors. And in the res result tensors, the, block ten the blocks are labeled with all the, uh, all the representation labels, but the matched irrep labels appear just once. And there is an additional rule that may happen that if I contract some tensors, then sometimes there is a lag or more lags that are not that uh, there is a representation label at the end. So if I if I perform the matchings, sometimes there is a representation label that has no legs that depend uh, on it anymore. So uh, just the motivation to three. And in that case, I say that I have to sum up the tensor blocks along this uh, 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 redundant uh, representation index. So it's not redundant. So uh, along this uh, representation label that is not, uh, that, that doesn't have a lag and uh, depending lag anymore. So the motivation to three is, uh, for example, if I see the well-known uh, uh, orthogonality relation uh, of the clashes, then I see that uh, if I uh, sum over capital M gamma and alpha, and I, uh, pre uh, uh, this is the product of the clash and the clash conjugate, then, because this the clebsch gordon coefficient describes me a unitary transformation, so at the end I get a delta. But in this uh, sum, I have to sum over the gamma, so I have to sum over the uh, uh, representation gamma that appears in the product of gamma one and gamma two. And uh, if I draw this equation graphically, that means I contract alpha and m, because I contract these two guys. Uh, that's why the gamma one, gamma two. And gamma is the same, so I get gamma one must be the same as gamma one prime, and gamma two must be the same as gamma two prime uh, because of the contraction of the legs. But at the end, the gamma, the, there is no lag in the result tensor that depends on gamma, and that's why I have to sum over gamma. So this is why I have this additional rule. Okay, and now if I define my NA tensors, then I can. Uh, easily generalize my TBD algorithm for NA MPS. So, for example, if I have the two site uh, uh, time evolution operator U, then if I calculate the matrix element of this guy between any two NA MPS states, then I realize that uh, using the orthogonality of the clashes, I can uh, cover 
this U tensor with four Clebsch tensors, and then I can define a reduced evolution operator. Okay, a reduced evolution operator can be applied directly on the uh, upper layer of my MPS. So then the TBD algorithm uh, is defined on the upper layer of my MPS. Okay, the price I pay for it uh, to creating this reduced operator is that uh, this reduced operator is uh, has eight uh, representation indices, <coughs> but uh, uh, it turns out that this is not a problem when I write my simulation using the multiplication rules defined uh, in the slide before. I can use this guy and uh, apply this guy on the upper layer. Okay, so and now uh, we tested uh, this. Uh, uh, non abelian MPS and non abelian TBD algorithm on the SU3 Hubbard model. In the SU3 Hubbard model, I have three colors. Uh, a is a color index, and I have a hopping on the consecutive side. So this is a 1D uh, Hubbard chain, and I have this uh, usual Hubbard uh, coupling uh, that on the same side these guys repel each other. In the initial state, I created a charge density wave where on every uh, third side, I put three particles there, and then I have two empty sides. And then I start, uh, I, I, I follow the evolution of that state, and I try to measure something like, I, I measure the charging of the sides, I can measure charge-charge correlations, and I can measure, for example, the von Neumann entropy. And uh, I'm interested in technical questions, also, that how do these uh, measured uh, values depend on the bond dimension? And how, uh, how long uh, can I simulate? So that means how long can I trust my simulation? How long times? So for example, if I, if I just turn off interactions, in that case, I can, uh, we, we could uh, calculate, uh, for example, the side charging also exactly, because this is a free fermion system. And then we could compare uh, the TBD result with uh, uh, this exact uh, uh, exact value with these exact values. And I see that uh, the TBD uh, follows these uh, oscillations uh, quite well. But to follow, uh, I have I have a question. Uh, so to follow uh, these oscillations up to time four or five, I need quite high bond dimensions. So 40, 45,000 uh, uh, 45, uh, uh, is a quite large bond dimension. OK, again, if I uh, calculate the von Neumann entropy of the half chain, I see that uh, I can, uh, I can uh, uh, get the exact result up to, say, t equals 4. Or five, uh, four point five. If I have quite large bond dimensions, what happens if I if I uh, if I uh, turn on interactions? Okay, then I don't have my exact results anymore, but I can see what happens with the von Neumann entropy. Uh, for u equals one, I see a slightly lower growth rate of the entropy, but it's not uh, drastically lower for u equals one. But again, I need quite large bond dimensions to follow uh, uh, follow the dynamics up to times uh, larger than t equals four, and uh, I can follow also the charge oscillations. And uh, for these moderate values of u, I see uh, <coughs> exponential dampings of the originally algebraic oscillations, and I can get back this uh, damping rate. And I, I can also calculate the charge-charge correlation functions. So what I see up to u equals 1, uh, I see that uh, this uh, quite oscillatory behavior uh, is uh, damned. And I see a nice uh, light cone in the charge-charge correlation functions. OK, and one can ask, what is the numerical efficiency uh, of my calculations? Of course, if we have our code, we can uh, degrade the symmetry. So for example, I, I instead of using SU3 cross U1, I can use just U1 cross U1 cross U1. That means I, I keep 
the color charges separately as a U1 charge, or, or I can just use a total charge conservation, a simple U1 symmetry, or I can turn off all the symmetries. And now I can compare the memory usage uh, and, the, and the CPU time uh, per step for these different cases. And what we see that the SU3 cross U1 code beats the best abelian version, the U1 cross U1 cross U1, by almost a factor of 100, also in memory and also in um, uh, CPU time. So for example, uh, we can see that at the end, I used here 20 uh, gigabytes of memory, and uh, I could reach bond dimension 100,000, and also the CPU time per uh, an evolution step was in that case about uh, a half an hour. So it's <coughs> it's it's a uh, and it was uh, done uh, on on a one core of a cluster. So it was a, it's a it's a one core calculation. There was no parallelization in that case. But also I can use my simple desktop computer to get uh, these uh, extremely large bond dimensions. So now I, I think I summarize uh, uh, I summarize uh, my talk. So uh, we defined matrix product states for general non abelian symmetries. Uh, we introduced NA tensors and uh, their algebraic properties. Uh, these are uh, general objects, so the structure does not depend on a specific symmetry. Uh, they have a, a rather simple contraction rules. Uh, and uh, not only TBD, but various uh, MPS algorithms like DMRG or uh, TDVP can be reformulated using these NA tensors. I demonstrated uh, or code using uh, uh, the SU3 Hubbard model. And uh, uh, we tested also the efficiency of the code. And we have almost two orders of magnitude speed up compared to the best Abelian code. Okay, and uh, I want to acknowledge uh, the help of my colleagues, Gergely Zarand, Ursh Legaz, and Pashku Moka, and also the financial support of uh, the grants, uh, some grants in Hungary. So thank you very much for your kind attention, and I appreciate questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for an interesting talk. And um... Now we actually, if I'm not mistaken, we would be starting the next talk. So, but I think we should have time for at least uh, one question. If someone has a question, please, uh, please, please say it now, or later on in the break. Also, you can also, uh, of course, make questions in the break after the second talk. Yes, uh, I will be ready. Mm -hmm. uh, well, in the break. I have a question now. Yes. If you if you apply this to two D to two D problems, would you get the same speed up? Has it been done or not? Uh, we or we have for example. Uh, so we haven't uh, tested uh, these tensors for uh, for PEPs, but uh, I I think that uh, one can get the same speed up. There is a there is a paper, Claudius Hubik, uh, who used a different code, but but they they use. But uh, the code of Andras Wexerbaum, yes, exactly. uh, this Q spaces code. Uh, so the two codes are quite similar. Uh, we think uh, our version is a bit, bit uh, simpler, but, but they got a, a large speed up. So I, do, they, I, do they have it also for the 2D case? Or you, do they try it already for the 2D case? Or it's also for 1D system? So uh, Claudius Hubig, they tried for the 2D. So, so okay. there is a paper from Claudius. It's, uh, uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps for non-abelian symmetries, okay. I think. So, okay. so they, they did it and they could reach quite large bond dimensions. Okay, in perhaps bond dimensions are not 100,000, but, but they could reach, uh, uh, as I remember, 20. And this okay. is quite big. For That's quite big, I agree. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the question. All right, so let's, not try, let's try not to get too, too late. So I'm going to interrupt the recording and then start it immediately, immediately again. And um, please stop okay. sharing your screen. Uh, yes, thanks. And then um, we can already start. Uh, sh you can already start sharing your screen, uh, Joel. Okay. So let me first stop the recording.